Thank you. Hello and welcome to the MIT Sloan School for the 26th in our Innovation at Work webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. I'm Peter Hurst and I'm going to be moderating uh, today's webinar uh, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Dr. Phil Button and Professor Fiona Murray, both of whom teach uh, extensively in our Executive Education programs uh, at uh, MIT Sloan. Excuse me while we advance the slides. Uh, the Innovation at Work webinar series is designed uh, to bring to the world insights and experience from uh, our faculty colleagues here at MIT Sloan School, uh, and particularly those who do teach in our executive education uh, programs. Uh, as you can see on the next slide, uh, and you're already familiar with our speakers today, uh, Phil Budden and Fiona Murray, are both extremely active uh, in research and teaching around uh, topics of innovation, both for corporations uh, and also for governments and whole countries uh, here at MIT in a variety of programs. So we're especially delighted to have them here with us uh, today. Uh, and I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Phil Bunn, who will introduce today's program to us. Thank you, Phil. Excellent, Peter. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And Fiona and I are delighted to be here today, so thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to be talking about innovation ecosystems. And as you can see, we've set out five things that we are going to cover today. We're going to start off with the uh, definition of innovation. It informs our and your approach to innovation. We're going to touch on the curious topic of why the world isn't flat. And then we're going to take you through some ecosystem perspectives, including uh, stakeholders, and finally wrap up uh, in this introductory webinar by giving you a sense of what this can mean for you wherever in the world you are and uh, whatever sort of organization you are a leader in, how you can take this approach to, to innovation. So first of all, let's turn to innovation. Um, this is a much used word. Uh, some would say it's a buzzword. It's out there. Everybody seems to want innovation. Your boss probably wants it. Your customers, your stakeholders probably want it. So let's start off with a definition of innovation. Uh, and with that, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Professor Fiona Murray, who co-leads MIT's Innovation Initiative. So Fiona, could you help us with defining innovation? Yes, thank you, Phil. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, before I give you the MIT definition, uh, I'd like to ask everybody uh, listening and participating in our webinar just to take a moment for themselves to think about how they would define innovation. It's always useful to define it yourself before you hear from us uh, how we think about it. So we define innovation quite simply as the process of taking ideas from inception to impact. And we have that definition for a number of reasons. Uh, we think about this as a process, not products and services. And by having that sort of definition, it lets us think about the entire journey from the start of really coming up with ideas and those moments of inception all the way through to actually having impact on the world. Uh, we use the word impact and not profit because we want to make sure that for every organization they can think about how to define impact for themselves. So we don't want to presume that impact means profit. Uh, it might mean social impact. It could mean environmental impact and change. It could mean any one of a, of a series of goals. The important thing is to really be clear about what you mean when you think about innovation in your organization. Uh, we think about innovation as um, and an idea as the match between a problem and a solution. So we don't think of uh, innovation as simply just a particular problem to be solved. We don't think about it as simply a solution, a gadget or a piece of technology. We really do emphasize that an idea is the match between a problem and a solution. Uh, we also think really carefully about who's involved. So innovation happens in lots of different organizations. And again, by taking this process definition that takes us from inception all the way through to impact, we basically make sure that there's a space for a whole range of different organizations, from universities and startups who are often deeply involved in the beginning of that process to corporations and even governments uh, later on in the process. Excellent. Uh, I think it's really helpful work from the MIT Innovation Initiative. Now, one thing I want to clarify here is to distinguish slightly between innovation and innovative. Um, and MIT collaboratively researches and teaches about both uh, true innovation and more innovative behavior. And we like to separate this out, uh, starting off with capital I innovation, by which we mean the formal processes of taking science, research, and technology uh, through to impact. This is an innovation that a lot of people think of. But at the other end of the spectrum, we also see little i innovation. 
And this is signifying more widely applicable behaviors. Um, and this is something that we see at the far end of the spectrum. So we have a spectrum going from little i to big i innovation. Um, and many of the insights about innovative behavior are actually coming from research at the cutting edge of capital I innovation. So we quickly whip through that slide and go to the next graphic. So I like to do this in a, a visual format. And we see here a spectrum from little i innovative behavior out to capital I innovation. And the reason we do this is we don't want people to think that innovation is only the stuff that's out there at the frontier. We actually believe that there's little i innovation where everybody has a role uh, and it can have a huge impact. One of the other ways I differentiate this is to think about capital I innovation being something with a 10x change. So it's the kind of things that uh, startups are doing. It's the kinds of things that venture capitalists and risk, cap risk capitalists uh, like to support. And the little i innovation is more of a 10% change, so a much more modest form of innovation, but still innovation. It's not just incremental change, six sigma, slight improvements. It's looking for a 10% change, whether it's doing something 10% faster, 10% mm -hmm. uh, more cheaply, 10% more effectively for the customers. So it's really important that we have a whole spectrum and that people can find themselves somewhere out on that spectrum. Um, also, a couple of other things about innovation. It's important to recall that innovation is more than just technology. Um, some people think it's just about technology, and it isn't. It's much more, although digital technologies from, from the cutting edge end of innovation do, in fact, enable much more innovative behaviors. Also, it's more than just a buzzword. Uh, if it's just allowed to be a buzzword, it sort of cheapens the concept. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's certainly plenty of buzzwords out there. You may have them in your organization, agile, lean, entrepreneurs, sprint and scrum, all kinds of things. What we try to look at here are the underlying things. And one of the key conclusions is that innovation is in need of managing and leadership. It's not just a question of letting innovation happen by itself. There is a role for management and leadership. Uh, management and leadership is key for actually achieving this change, particularly in uncertain times, um, for greater diversity and inclusion, and also to empower people. Uh, and I say that leadership of innovation really matters. Um, even if the leaders themselves don't always feel that they're the most innovative, entrepreneurial, or tech savvy, there is a role for leaders in this to achieve the kind of points we've made there. Absolutely. So when we think about leadership, though, I think it's also really important to go back to the beginning as we talked about mm -hmm. of the whole innovation process and make sure that we really understand that innovation uh, and these ideas that we know are really important start, often start with either a problem or a solution. Uh, there's often been a debate about whether we should start with sort of, you know, technology push or market pull. I think that there can be a variety of different ways in which we can begin really effectively at the innovation process. And for many organizations and individuals, they start with a problem. You know, I have a colleague here on MIT's campus, uh, Professor Hugh Herr, who uh, lost limbs in an accident. And so much of his purpose around his innovation process has been really trying to come up with new prostheses to solve that very personal problem. You might think of him as doing some sort of user-led innovation, although on a problem that many, many people uh, sadly suffer from. On the other hand, in many organizations, especially the more classic R&D-driven organizations, people tend to start with a solution. So they might be thinking about new machine learning algorithms, new quantum dots, and then try to work out really uh, what to do with them that's useful. The real point, though, is that innovation comes from that match between a problem and a solution. So if I'm really working on something to do with new limbs and what have you, I want to think about what's the right match of the sorts of material. It might be carbon fibers, it might be buckyballs, uh, that are really going to be a very useful solution to my problem. If I'm developing new machine learning algorithms, I might decide that it's the traffic problem in, in the middle of Boston that I want to really focus my attention on. And so it's really starting to come up with that match. And it's that matching that is often at the core of the innovation process, making sure my solution is really robust, and then my problem is a problem that a whole series of customers uh, and end users might meaningfully have. And so as we think about building on uh, the visual, uh, Phil, that you've shared with us mm. about the innovation landscape, we like to think along the x-axis as being all about the degree of novelty of a solution. So if you're right down in the left-hand corner and you're dealing with solutions that are very similar than ones that you've had before, as we go out on that x-axis with degree of novelty, we're working on really new sorts of solutions. The same on the y-axis. If we start in the bottom left-hand corner, we're thinking about problems that we understand really well. Um, 
all the way up to the frontier of thinking about uh, problems that are really new. So in the very bottom left-hand corner, we think about business as usual, things that we've already done that we know how to do, and we move right out to the frontier. We're really thinking about capital I innovation, as you described it, and we're really thinking about doing things which have a lot of risk associated with them, because there's both problem uncertainty and solution uncertainty, and that can be very, very challenging for an organization. Definitely. Thank you. And overlaying the little I to capital I, uh, innovation spectrum there, you can work out roughly where you are, uh, which innovation space you're working in. One of the great challenge modes, failure modes for this, is when organizations say they want innovation, but aren't actually working out what type of innovation do they want. Do they want little I innovation? Is the tolerance only for a 10% change? Or do they want capital I innovation out at the frontier, 10x change? And then against the X and Y axes, are they trying to, to move along the vector that takes them out to the novel solution? Or are they actually going on a different vector towards a degree of novelty in, in the problem? And this is where we find a lot of organizations come unstuck. And I think this is why it's really helpful to have this, yeah. this set of definitions. And I think the other thing that's really worth pointing out is that as an organization, you may well want a portfolio approach. People talk about a balanced portfolio, but I think as you can see from this framework, the question is really, how do you want to distribute your time and your effort and your innovation projects across this innovation landscape, mm -hmm. and how much of each? And really understand which ones are causing you challenge in your organization, and which ones are easier and more natural for your organization to do. No, that's, that's very useful. Thank you. Um, so here we've been talking about where in the innovation landscape your innovation projects are and, and possibly a portfolio of projects along the spectrum. We also think it's really important to think about where in the world you are doing this. So uh, Tom Friedman came out with a book, The World is Flat, right at the beginning of the 21st century, which was very exciting. It attracted a lot of attention. Uh, in short, he basically argued that with the incoming technologies, anything could happen pretty much anywhere. Uh, and in some ways, elements of this come, have come true. But in terms of innovation, we don't see this as actually having been the case. In fact, in the new global economy, the world of any innovation is not flat. Uh, it's unfair, um, but the world is not flat. Uh, and this is what has led us to see these places where innovation is taking place as, as ecosystems. Here we just have a couple spread across there, London, Tel Aviv, New York, and Boston. But there are many other places outside of Silicon Valley where innovation is happening. It's just not happening everywhere in the world uh, in the way that we might have been led to believe by the Friedman book. Um, we discovered this by working with regional partners around the world here through our global program called REAP. Uh, this is taken from that website showing various places. So we've discovered that our definition of innovation and our approach to talking about innovation in ecosystems and what this means for leaders and executives um, really does apply across the world. So what I'd like to do now is have Josh push out a poll. Uh, and the poll question is, where in the world are you? Um, so there are the regions. Please choose which region you're in. Uh, you can either choose the region you're actually physically in or where you happen to be visiting at the moment. Um, but please just take uh, a few moments to do that. We are fascinated to find out, even while doing this live in the US lunchtime, to see where people have managed to, um, to actually uh, connect with us today. Right. So, Fiona, taking that global perspective, um, I was curious what your perspectives are, and where do you think people are going to be patching in from? Oh, well, as soon as you ask me to guess, then I get the answer put up in front of me very nicely. Josh, thank you for that, and thank you for saving me. Um, it looks like we have about three quarters of the people who are joining us from the US and Canada, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, a group from Mexico, Central and South America, about 10% from Europe, and uh, some friends and colleagues from the Middle East, Africa, China, and East Asia, and uh, India and South Asia. Uh, none of our friends from Australia uh, and New Zealand, with whom we do quite a lot of work on innovation. Yeah. Yes, I think, it's the middle of the I think it may be the middle of their night. When this is done as a recording, uh, we, we will probably get people from other parts, but uh, that's a good turnout. That's very exciting. So one of the things that I think all of you uh, will probably experience as you're working in particular places around the world uh, is that, as we've said, innovation is not evenly distributed. Uh, we know that talent and brain power is very evenly distributed. Uh, I don't think there's any monopoly on wisdom, but we know that really effective innovation process and innovation activities are not evenly distributed. 
Uh, we often think about Massachusetts as being um, a region that is really uh, blessed by having a tremendously strong innovation ecosystem. But as you can see from this map, this is a map of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it's been developed by our colleague, Professor Scott Stern. Uh, it focuses on what they call entrepreneurial quality. And it's basically uh, a heat map, if you like, of very innovative startups uh, distributed across the state. As you can see, they're highly, highly concentrated in the east of the state, basically around Boston uh, and around Route 128. Uh, there's not nearly as much innovation-driven activity happening in the west of the state or down in the south or on the beaches of Cape Cod. Uh, much and all as though the governor might prefer it to be more evenly mm. distributed. Uh, it really is very, very concentrated. And as you look at this next map, what you'll see is really a focus zooming in from the uh, state level right down to the level of thinking about Kendall Square, which is where we're sitting here, uh, where MIT uh, is surrounded by a very vibrant uh, ecosystem uh, with startups and other organizations around. And what you'll see here, this is focusing particularly on where the biotech uh, companies and activity is around innovation. But this would be true of much innovative activity. So it's highly, highly uh, concentrated in very special regions uh, around the world. So I want to just take a minute to, to reflect on what that means um, for uh, organizations and for all of you as leaders in your organizations as you think about building an innovation strategy. I think if we step back and we think about it, you know, if we were to wind the clock back 10 or 20 years, we really think about um, organizations focusing very internally on their innovation activities. So you might think about R&D as very much an ivory tower sort of, uh, sort of activity. And so you have very iconic uh, research organizations like uh, PARC, uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, uh, that as you can see uh, right next to the, uh, to the image, was really looked like a, a large park, but, but literally and figuratively with lots of buildings, really quite isolated. You might think of universities as being ivory towers or national laboratories being in the middle of woods and forests, and that was a really internal process. I think one of the most important shifts that we've seen is a shift to open innovation. And this was really previewed by my colleague Eric von Hippel as he started to talk about open innovation and, and user innovation. That very much took the opposite perspective and said it's not about what we do inside our organizations. We need to tap into the talent that is really worldwide uh, to do something um, that's going to drive innovation in our organizations. And so companies shifted from an internal innovation strategy to a very open innovation strategy. We found that to be really challenging for many organizations. Where in the world do you need to focus? And so rather than doing that in a completely um, spread very, very thin around the world sort of way, we found that organizations are increasingly focused on very geographically specific innovation ecosystems. And so they're not looking for talent globally necessarily, but they're looking around the globe for those key innovation ecosystem hotspots where they're going to focus most of their innovation strategy and attention. And those hotspots really are more distributed than they used to be. Mm. So whilst in the past it might have been that we all had to move to Silicon Valley to try to find some of the innovative talent and ideas and startups that we really wanted, today in the US we might also be looking at Boston or Pittsburgh um, and some other uh, emerging second tier cities. But we're also thinking about Europe and we're thinking about mm. places like London and Berlin. Uh, we're also looking in Asia across China and Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen. And we're also looking to uh, Africa and places like like uh, Lagos and Accra and uh, parts and Cape Town are for thinking about innovation ecosystems. And so the real challenge, I think, for leaders today is to think about whether where they are is really a innovation ecosystem that they want to tap into mm -hmm. or build, and if not, where else do they really want to uh, connect the dots? Sure. And listening to that, there's there seems to be calls for hope there that innovation is not just being stuck in places like Silicon Valley. It is now happening in certain other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And what I like about the MIT approach is studying where it's happening and trying to understand why it happens in certain places, not other places. Here we have images of China and Nigeria, London and, and Boston, and understanding where it's happening to share that advice so that others can, can tap into that. So one of the things we've discovered, if we go to the stakeholder model, is that in all of these world-class innovation ecosystems, we see the same five stakeholders cropping up. Um, and we use this simple model to teach about the kinds of players you need uh, to be uh, engaged and involved in your ecosystem. In the world's leading ecosystems, they're already involved. So if you're in an ecosystem that needs to improve, it's important to work out which of these five.
Maybe I'll just say something about the five, because okay. this MIT contribution is quite different from previous just government industry, military, industrial approaches, um, but it also go, goes beyond the triple helix of just university, government, and corporate. But I think key here at this round table is that we have the entrepreneur present. It's so important if you're trying to develop a, an innovation ecosystem to have the innovation-driven entrepreneurs involved, uh, explaining what's going on from their perspective, and they are producing the companies of the future. So you can't just have today's companies. You need to have those leaders who are going to produce future companies. Secondly, we have risk capital, which in the MIT definition goes beyond just venture capital, which is a highly optimized closed-end 10-year fund, um, to a whole variety of providers of the kind of venture financing that makes a difference. And this can be from friends, family, and fools, through early stages of financing angels or syndicates of angels, through venture capitalists, but also out the other side to private equity or commercial bank loans. There's a whole variety, and not everybody has venture capitalists. So it's important to realize that others can provide that venture financing. And then, of course, the traditional three, university. We're delighted to see that universities play a role, although from some of our research, certain universities find it easier than others. So you can't expect every university to, to play the, the same role. Uh, and finally, government and, and corporates. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time talking to governments and corporates about how they can play a role in support of the ecosystems. Uh, neither can have complete control over an ecosystem, so they need to understand their role and how they can contribute. And one final point is we have this as a round table, so nobody's actually in charge. It's just important to have these five stakeholders come together. And then what they achieve will then ripple out and help wider uh, customers, communities, markets, electorates, but it's important to, to have all five involved. So we're now going to turn to our second poll, so we'll pause for a moment while Josh sets that up. And what we'd like you to do out there is just identify with one of the five stakeholders. We're fascinated to, to see uh, who's lined up. I understand there's a little bit of a lag on the numbers that we get in, so um, we're just interested to see at the first cut uh, who we have out there representing these various stakeholder groups. Which do you think might be the most popular one? I'm guessing it's going to be the corporates, but uh, let's see what we find. Well, I think it might be corporate. I think going government. I think government might have a good, strong showing, but let's see uh, how the poll goes. Um, of course, this is a, a live webinar at the moment, so it's only people who are actually in the right time zones to hear this, but uh, let's have a look. Well, Phil, as you've said, uh, this is something that we do a lot of work with people from lots of the different stakeholder groups, and we also find if these groups work together uh, that they can be really effective. Uh, one of the groups that is often quite difficult to bring to the table as we think about building an ecosystem strategy are, are risk capital funds, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think our results suggest that that's mm -hmm. going to be the case here as well, which is hard to get those risk capitalists to the table to uh, think about the innovation ecosystem, although they're actually extremely important. Um, but I think I'm seeing here with the results is that we do have a majority of uh, corporate participants. Does look like welcome, a lot. But a third of the folks who are with us, I think, are entrepreneurs. And so uh, we're, that's tremendous news because entrepreneurs are very, very important uh, to innovation ecosystems and really do need to think about an ecosystem strategy for themselves, for their organizations, uh, and you know, for those around them. Definitely. Well, Taking that, that we do have a majority of corporates out there, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, all five stakeholder groups are really important. Picking up on the fact that we have uh, corporates there, um, then if we look at this next slide, one of the reasons we have the stakeholder model set up like this, and we're focusing here on the corporates, is the relationship with the stakeholders immediately next to you on the circle are relatively straightforward. But those across the stakeholder model, across the star pentacle, are not always so easy. So for corporates, we often find that they want more innovation. Um, they're starting to think about being in particular places, and the benefit for them to take an ecosystem perspective is they can start to work out with which stakeholders do they need to engage more. Uh, we sit here at MIT, a university. We know um, that it's not always easy for corporates to find their way around complex places like universities. So we spend quite a lot of time in our teaching advising corporates how to engage with universities like MIT and other ones. Um, but equally tricky is the relationship of working with the entrepreneurs. 
who, um, you know, it's great that we had so many listening in today, uh, but we know they're awfully busy running their enterprises. It's a non-trivial thing to be working on such a startup enterprise. But it's also one of the key relationships is working out how corporates can, in fact, work with those. So as we draw this section on the stakeholders to a close, we've identified the five stakeholders who are key to ecosystems. But Fiona, what else is going on in these ecosystems that perhaps those who are new to this perspective might want to hear about? Yeah. So I think what's very useful is as we think about the best way for these different stakeholders to work together and to work effectively uh, with one another, we really want to understand the innovation process that's actually taking place within the innovation ecosystem. And the place I like to look to really try to understand that innovation process is really at what startups are doing. I think some of the best run startups often have a really powerful innovation engine at the heart of what they're doing. They can often be drawing on ideas that were um, generated uh, from you know, inside the university uh, or ideas that they may have um, explored or customer problems when they were working in a big company. Uh, but startup entrepreneurs can be really powerful as an innovation process. So as we think about those, we think about the entrepreneurial startups as having a very critical role in the ecosystem. And as I've said, they're very effective at driving those early stages of the innovation process. Uh, one way to characterize this, uh, there's a lot of different buzzwords, but we can think of really good startups as starting with a match and a hypothesis of a potential match between a problem and a solution. So we think about them as having this hypothesis where they're having an imaginary problem and an imaginary solution that will become real as they develop mm -hmm. it and they go across uh, that entire uh, innovation process spectrum. What those startups then do very, very well is they really define, order, and test these sorts of assumptions through a series of what we'll call these innovation loops. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we can see that innovation loops at, at the core require two different processes to be carrying out in a sort of a circular pattern. So we start off with experimentation. So really good uh, innovation projects start with uh, testing ideas rapidly and effectively so as to really maximize cost effective information gathering and learning. Uh, that sort of experimentation approach I think is a really important way to think about the innovation process. We have this hypothesis about what the project is we're trying to do and then we're going to go through through this series of learning loops that start with well-designed experiments. Every time a learning loop has to, is, is done, you have to close that loop and evaluate what I've learned. So I have to take that information, and I have to be guided by the evidence that I've just gathered and how that connects across to my assumptions. And then I have to decide what's, what I'm going to do next. Did I learn enough uh, that causes me to want to proceed with the project? Or have I uh, basically learned things that tell me it really is time to stop? And this core framework, these innovation loops, are for us uh, lie very much at the heart of the innovation process that happens really effectively inside innovation ecosystems. People sometimes use buzzwords like lean startup, agile, uh, a process like disciplined entrepreneurship, or they talk about the business model canvas or design thinking. For us, all these different labels really are labels that um, signal a core fundamental process, these innovation loops. And these different um, approaches, lean startup, agile, provide different tools that you can deploy to experiment more or less effectively. And so we really want people to understand mm. this because we think this is at the core of innovation, especially in innovation ecosystems. And I think that's really helpful to have this insight because it sort of demystifies what's going on in the innovation ecosystem. It's the mm -hmm. kinds of things that we see many of these entrepreneurial startups are doing, uh, and they find quite easy to do, but others don't. And so I think it really shines some light on the magic at the heart of the innovation ecosystem. So one of the things that we know about large organizations is they find it quite difficult to actually engage in these sorts of innovation loops themselves from an internal point of view. So one of the real benefits of going from a purely uh, internal R&D sort of a process where we're, we're building an ivory tower and we're doing all the research and innovation internally to working externally is that you can really rely on the ecosystem and universities and startups in that ecosystem to really experiment for you in many ways. Because we know inside a big organization, it's quite difficult to test rapidly if your processes are really designed to emphasize precision over speed. Mm -hmm. As we know from our work with big organizations, both public and private, it can be very difficult for a big organization to go out and do some testing when people are really rewarded for getting their answers correct and precise as opposed to just learning rapidly from things. 
It can be quite difficult for big organizations to talk to their customers directly, especially for the uh, front end of that innovation process to approach customers who have very high expectations. And there are often not many methods to create rough and ready sort of prototypes uh, that are used in these organizations. On the other hand, if you think about the evaluation process, again, we know that actually risk capital providers are really effective at some of that evaluation and really help startups do that well and effectively in a very hard-headed way, even when they're in love with their ideas. It's going to be very difficult in big organizations. You tend to like to compare to business as usual, so these innovation projects often don't stack up very well. It's quite difficult when you're trying to make decisions with little information and an organization that's used to having very precise spreadsheets. And so we really see that this innovation loop is a hard process to master for big organizations. And so it's worth them understanding how this can work uh, in the ecosystem so they can learn from that and bring some of those uh, best practices inside and how they can tap into other people engaging in this big practice as well. Now, that's very helpful insights from the frontiers of innovation, and, and now we're going to turn to those business leaders. Um, what does this mean? We, we've talked about the nature of innovation, how we define it. We've talked about the fact that it happens in very specific places, which we call ecosystems. And so we'd just like to run through a series of the, the key questions here. Um, the world of innovation is rather unfairly uh, not flat. It happens in key ecosystems. So the first question is, in which ecosystems does your business need to be? Now, it may be that your business has to be in a particular ecosystem. It's attached to that regional economy or for all kinds of reasons, maybe state ownership, it has to be there. But you may want to think about whether there's other ecosystems that you want to have a bit of a presence. Uh, a lot of large companies here in the United States are thinking about where they want to expand their operations, and they seem to be going to ecosystems. So you think of Amazon and Google uh, setting up operations, as is, as is Apple. Um, when you start to think about the fact that you need to be in other ecosystems, the end you want to ask yourself very clearly in good business approach, what are the specific ends for engaging? Mm -hmm. uh, the other members, the stakeholders of an ecosystem are also very busy with their own particular projects and work. So as a, a business leader turning up, why is it you're engaging that ecosystem? You need to be very specific about that. Mm -hmm. And also very specific about how you're going to approach the different stakeholders. Um, the entrepreneurs will have a very different set of uh, priorities and motives and timescales than other players in the ecosystem, for example, universities who are probably attached to a particular place, often the university of somewhere, so they're not going anywhere, uh, but the entrepreneurs themselves could get up and move uh, quite, quite easily to go to an ecosystem where they have the best chance. Um, government may have a completely different set of time frames driven by the electoral cycle. Other corporates there may be driven more by quarterly results. So you need to think about how you're going to engage the ecosystem's key stakeholders. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of corporates, one of the challenges is to engage the entrepreneurs. And so this Fiona, is where I really like your innovation loop approach. Because the entrepreneurs are going through a series of ever-growing innovation loops, uh, testing their assumptions, running experiments, and evaluating them, those who wish to engage with such entrepreneurs and their startups need to think about at which stage. You know, if you're just interested in corporate research, that's a very early stage. If you're just interested in some sort of acquisition at the M&A end, that's a completely different bit. Many of the corporates we work with who want to get the most out of engaging an ecosystem need to pick one of the intermediate loops mm -hmm. where they work out the best place to connect. And maybe I can just pick up there and say that I think as we think about what stage in the innovation loops and as we teach when we talk about this in more detail, uh, we think about some of the different mechanisms uh, that organizations can use. So if you're trying to engage at the very earliest stage of the innovation loop, uh, you can often think about running hackathons mm -hmm. and other sorts of activities uh, which help you with some of those very early cycles of matching problems and solutions. If you want to do something on a larger scale, then prizes and prize competitions can be really a powerful mechanism for engagement. If you want to think about working with startup companies that are a little bit later in their stages of development, then accelerators can also be quite powerful, uh, where there are often collections of startup companies all going through um, a process together, but they're effectively going through a sort of an early Series A financing type of stage of innovation. And I think what's so interesting is that this ecosystem engagement, it can mean picking some of the best and most interesting startups. Mm -hmm. 
but increasingly there are these intermediary organizations like accelerators who can help do that with you and for you. And I think that's also making a big difference to how these ecosystems are really growing and how big organizations, uh, corporates and governments can really engage uh, across that stakeholder map mm -hmm. uh, with startups in particular, but with the risk capital community. And universities also play an interesting role in that whole activity. Sure. And just to pick up on the last line of that slide there, it's very important for your organization to actually have a strategy mm -hmm. about the nature of its innovation ecosystem engagement. Uh, one of the things we do in our two-day, but also in our online course, is actually work through some of those options that like you set out there, hackathons, accelerators, and prize competitions, to actually talk, out, talk about which one might be the, ro the right thing at the right time for the corporate to, to take that forward. Um, so as we move into our final phase, um, I'd just like to talk about some of the common leadership challenges. We've been teaching this for quite a while now, so we get lots of feedback from executives who come to us in person or executives that we teach here at, at MIT through, through Exec Ed. Um, and we're seeing quite a few things that are coming back as, as common challenges. Um, so here we go, fear of failure. I actually like to think of this as the F word of innovation. It should be banished. I think most startup entrepreneurs don't actually set out to explicitly fail. Most venture capitalists would not support them. We as MIT faculty do not try and train people to fail. And my experience of having been an executive myself is it's rather career, career limiting to actually write failure into one's objectives. So I would actually like to banish the word failure and move to a more experimental approach. We, we don't have time today to go into detail about that, um, but it is a very common problem and I think failure is problematic. Another challenge is a desire for immediate results. Uh, often leadership, senior leadership at an organization will want immediate results. I think one of the things we caution people is it takes time to engage the ecosystem. Um, we use this uh, biology uh, paradigm because it's, it's a living organism. One needs to think about how one engages, and so you can't just go in and expect immediate results. Uh, you need to proceed carefully. And what about the, the big splash? Why do you see that as a problem for leaders? Well, I think what we see, and let me sort of couple uh, the big splash and aversion to small experiments together, uh, what we often see with big organizations is they want to um, do something that really makes a difference, something that makes a difference to their results, to their bottom line. And it's quite difficult to do that if you're going to run a series of small experiments. It doesn't feel as if that's going to amount to something that's adequate. So what happens is people want to run very large experiments. They want to run before they can walk, to put it another way. Uh, so what we try to do is have people think through having a platform for experimentation, undertaking a, a sensible number of experiments, making sure you learn from them, uh, then stopping a small, some of them, and then really focusing your attention on those that appear to be showing signs of success. I think it's much easier for organizations to run pilots with uh, customers and in places where they think are going to be mm -hmm. very successful, which is simply about convincing yourself that your idea was right as opposed to actually learning. And so that's something that I think we see a lot is that uh, desire for a pilot uh, that's really more cheerleading mm -hmm. than actual experimentation, learning, and innovation in the long yes. run. Whereas startups in the innovation loops are actually taking much more authentic, honest experiments where it's not about success or failure, it's about learning something very specific and not always under optimal circumstances, as, as we cover in our class. Uh, another key challenge for executives is um, that when one has an, initial, an, an innovation project, is that there's a lack of clear reporting. Uh, one doesn't really know how this is going to report back into the organization, or indeed have sufficient air cover, i.e. somebody senior in the organization who can hold the ring while you're uh, you know, taking the time to get results. Um, avoiding doing something to make a splash and really have the time to run authentic experiments. So these are really important. And then finally, once you've had a successful innovation project, one of the last things that people often overlook that can trip them up is actually reintegrating it back into the organization. You, you've been operating outside of business as usual, somewhere on that little I to capital I innovation spectrum. The challenge is how do you bring that back into business as usual and make sure that it doesn't get the corporate antibodies up but is actually landing well in the organization so you get the return on investment for having uh, run a project on, on innovation. These are the key things that are out there and obviously we can't go into all of the answers today but if if any of these are resonating with you, we'll share with you in a moment uh, ways, ways to work with us going forwards. Um, so with that, 
Um, at the very beginning, we said we'd cover these five things. So hopefully we have left you at the end of this webinar now with a good definition of innovation from the MIT Innovation Initiative. Thank you, Fiona, for that definition. Um, it informs our whole approach to innovation, ecosystems, stakeholders, and what you as leaders can do. We've explained why, sadly, the world isn't flat for innovation. It's not just going to naturally happen everywhere in the world, but there are things we can learn from the world's most effective innovation ecosystems that we can replicate elsewhere. So I think there is a message of hope here about taking those lessons. One of the key elements is there's five stakeholders. It's not just the traditional government and industry. Even with the triple helix adding in the university, that's not enough. Uh, ecosystem leaders really do need to hear the voice of the entrepreneurs and the providers of risk capital and other venture financing. And for the largest audience, uh, the corporate leaders, um, there is a role for corporates to uh, improve their own innovation by engaging with these ecosystems and thinking about how to then leverage that for uh, success and change within their organization, including uh, to, to the bottom line, which is important for these, but in a way that is respectful of the ecosystem from which they're trying to um, draw some sort of benefits and respectful of the very different perspectives of the other stakeholders. So with that, we've just confirmed what we covered today, and now I believe we're for Q and A. Great, thank you, Phil and Fiona. This is a fascinating topic, and I always learn new things when I hear you talk about it. Uh, and so have uh, our audience. We've been getting a lot of questions coming in, and so okay. now my task is to try to synthesize some of these questions into uh, things that perhaps we can ask you to answer. The first set uh, seemed to have to do with. Uh, this question of what is uh, an ecosystem, and if I can mm -hmm. extend that a little, um, one set of questions has to do with in what you're seeing in your research, do ecosystems have to be geographically focused, or are you seeing examples where they're geographically dispersed, and that relates to another set of questions which are about how does one make up for a missing stakeholder in your model, in your ecosystem? Can you offshore or outsource those, or do you have to find a way to uh, to fill that gap locally? So those are some very good questions. Um, so I think in terms of what an ecosystem really is, as we've set out, there's a whole set of actors that are very important to ecosystems. And we've tried to lay out the five types of actors that are the most important. And you might think of those actors as particular types of organizations, uh, the corporates, the government, uh, the risk capital, the universities, and the entrepreneurs. Obviously, those organizations are made up of people. And it really is those people actually throwing themselves in and participating in the ecosystem. What we know about uh, what makes ecosystems successful is very much based, I think, around MIT's view of system dynamics. So these are systems whereby, among these actors, resources get shared. And it really is that powerful resource sharing uh, that causes these ecosystems to create that positive dynamic. And so if I'm going to um, attract a set of human capital, uh, then I've got some very talented people coming to a particular place. Uh, the next group of people deciding where to locate are going to be naturally attracted uh, to being with like-minded individuals uh, or people who have similar innovation aspirations. So you get that sort of sense of shared resources. I think in terms of missing mm -hmm. stakeholders, Bill, we see this quite often, especially with the teams that we work mm -hmm. with. They sometimes come with a subset of stakeholders and don't have everybody at the table. Uh, but they seem to yes. be able to do good work <clears throat> to make things happen and to bring others on, along with them on the journey. Sure. No, that, that's exactly right. And, and through the global program of REAP, we work with teams from around the world who are trying to bring these stakeholders together. I think one of the things we advise in a very MIT data-driven way is for those who wish to play a role in an ecosystem, either for their organization or for the sake of the ecosystem, is to look at the relative uh, engagement of the stakeholders. And not in every ecosystem are all five going to be involved. There can sometimes be a little bit of a learning as to why are they not involved. Um, are they actually present in that place, but for some, for some reason the entrepreneurs and the corporates are separated from each other? Is, is government off in one place is the university in an ivory tower. And the places in the world that uh, develop their innovation ecosystems most effectively are the ones that actually find a way to engage all of them. Some of them have actually discovered they've got a, a lack of, of what they need in their particular region, their particular ecosystem. So try to find ways to either tap into their diaspora uh, to encourage people to come back home um, or, or other ways to incentivize corporations or startup entrepreneurs to move in. 
one, one quick comment on ecosystem, and what I like about the MIT approach and calling it an ecosystem, which is quite organic and alive, is these are quite fragile and they're developed by people. They do not respect traditional political boundaries. So, um, you know, in the past has often been a very sort of territorial approach, it's like this region must do this. And they're quite organic and they grow and they cross borders. And this is one of the challenge for governments and universities, for example, is to make sure that there is collaboration within the region because it may be the next town over some has some of the resources. Whereas if you're too narrow in your definition of region, um, then you may be missing some of the benefits that you have right on your doorstep. I think we've probably seen that here with uh, people thinking about um, the ecosystem emerging in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but in fact Boston and its growing innovation districts being an important piece of the puzzle uh, across borders into Somerville. And that might seem quite local in many ways, but for those people who are political leaders within, uh, those boundaries really matter. But for the entrepreneurs and innovators, those boundaries often don't matter. So we have to, but I do think geography, geography is important. And so we, we see, I think, ecosystems being connected across the world and there being quite close links from one ecosystem to the next. But I do think this is a quite physical, geographically constrained uh, concept. And so even in the world where we're increasingly here at MIT talking about you know, digital business and globalization and these kinds mm -hmm. of trends, you're seeing uh, still a significant importance of, of place. I think place really matters, especially mm. at the beginning of that innovation process. I think customers and markets are global, uh, but the ways in which ideas are often generated and the beginnings of that idea to impact process can be very uh, place-based. Mm -hmm. yes. It's one of the paradoxes of innovation. You know, Tom Friedman said the world is flat, the digital technologies means anything can happen anywhere. But as we study innovation, it doesn't happen everywhere. So trying to understand why it does. I think the good news with the underlying digital technologies is that places who weren't in the first waves uh, can now learn the lessons from the pioneers and actually catch up. And this is really important for regions around the world and businesses and entrepreneurs is to work out how to take those lessons and apply it so that as we move through the 21st century and innovation uh, has an opportunity to spread around the world, it won't do so evenly, but it will go to those areas that are actually forward leaning and doing what they need to do to capture the benefits. One interesting line of questions that's been coming in related to this as well is if we imagine this importance of place and there's mm -hmm. some geographic connectedness, what do you see is the importance of, uh, of, of diversity mm -hmm. uh, in these innovation ecosystems? Is there a sense that if we don't have diversity then that hinders innovation? I think so. I mean, as you know, Peter, I've spent a lot of time and done quite a lot of work thinking about diversity, especially the role of women in innovation and entrepreneurship. I think all the evidence points to the fact that when you have diverse teams, uh, you actually get much better innovation outcomes. Those teams can often be quite difficult to manage because the more we have people who are different, uh, the harder it is, especially in the beginning stages of teams and the innovation process, for them to uh, get along and make sure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. What we do know, I think, is that diversity is about more than just uh, gender. Right? It's also about race, it's about educational background, it's about social background, it's about experience, it's about ways of thinking. And so we want to think about diversity in a rich sort of way. Um, we also know that in most places it's about people who have different geographic experiences. And so it can be about people from all over the world, from different countries. And most of the innovation ecosystems we study are places that are extremely welcoming to people from different backgrounds. And indeed, those ecosystems where that isn't true, and I think in Silicon Valley that's been quite challenging uh, at some points in its development when it hasn't been as open to people from specific groups, that can really start to challenge and threaten those very positive reinforcing dynamics that really drive the system. Because so you do have to worry, I think, and we about inclusion, and we yes. spend time thinking about inclusion and working yes. on inclusive innovation ecosystems. So I think both diversity and inclusion really matter. And on diversity, one of the other axes is where one is in terms of feeling innovative or more focused on, on delivery and execution. And one of the great benefits of the course on Innovator's DNA, the sort of the MBTI of innovation, is it gives us another tool to think about uh, an axis of, of diversity that you need to have in your teams. Picking up on the inclusion, I think this matters not only for um, you know, the, the, the frontier of innovation where you want that to happen, but uh, innovation, as we've talked about with the world being flat, um, doesn't naturally spread its benefits. 
And so I think there's also an inclusion element that really matters around the world, is how do you make sure that what's happening at, happening at the frontiers of innovation uh, is actually inclusive of other communities and spreads elsewhere? As we saw from Professor Stern's heat map of Massachusetts, a lot of the innovation activity is taking place in Greater Boston. It's not spreading to other parts of Massachusetts. And I believe left to itself, uh, innovation might not spread evenly and be inclusive of other communities or other parts of the world. And I think this is where leadership and management comes into this. Uh, innovation is too important just to be allowed to run by itself. There are conscious decisions to be made how to make sure that uh, innovation is diverse and draws on diverse talents and, and promotes diversity, uh, but is also inclusive of wider communities, socioeconomic groups, ages, all different types of diversity. Uh, that's interesting, Phil, and what you're just touching on there uh, is very relevant to some questions that we've been getting about the purposes, uh, mm -hmm. ultimately, of the innovation that we're talking about. And you framed it, uh, Phil, in your introduction as being, uh, in one way, solving problems for customers. Mm -hmm. uh, this being MIT, a lot of people are interested in not how, not how do we solve problems for customers, but how do we solve what's all described in the questions as wicked problems mm -hmm. uh, for society and for the planet and for the world. Yes. Uh, what's the role of innovation and innovation ecosystems mm -hmm. uh, in those big wicked problems Problem. and solutions? So I like to think about that as mission-driven innovation. So I think that uh, we've talked about impact and we've really talked about the idea that you can we can think about what sort of impact we want to have with our innovation. As a place like MIT, we really want to think about solving big, important challenges and problems. Uh, for corporations and other organizations, they might have a different collection of problems that are often more focused on a set of customers. Uh, for governments, they want to solve problems that have often to do with the delivery of really effective services to entire communities uh, and, and at times their entire country. Uh, I, but I find that this idea of mission-driven innovation is something that's very, very powerful, for, especially for this younger generation. I find that our students come to us not because they want to solve problem sets, but because they want to solve real problems. They often don't know what those big problems are that they need to solve. They haven't had as much life experience. And so one of our jobs is to put those wicked problems in front of them and say, look, these are some important missions. Here are some wicked hard problems for you to think about and to try and put them in that problem-rich environment. I think at the moment we think about those in terms of things like water and food security, and we think about them in terms of energy and climate change. We think about those in terms of health and well-being and wellness across communities from you know, the poorest uh, to the more developed communities. So I think that the, in my experience, it's the mission-driven innovation that really does seem to be bringing people to the table around innovation, and particularly bringing young people and a diverse group of young people. They find that a really compelling message, and a more compelling message than solving problems that are perhaps very, very narrow and sort of improving things for a customer in, in a very sort of small way. They want to think about the big things. But the same fundamental processes, I think, are at work. These innovation yes. loops still matter. You might have a huge aspirational goal, but you really do actually have to go through those innovation loops to get there. I'd just like to pick up on that. I think that's exactly right. I think the, the techniques that we see from the cutting edge of innovation, capital I innovation, are relevant all the way through the spectrum. And I love the MIT definition that it's about impact, it's about missions, it's not just about profits. In fact, many of the entrepreneurs and the students are energized by being able to tackle a, a social, a cultural, a diversity, or environmental issue, rather than just solving a problem for the bottom line uh, of a particular corporate enterprise. But the great thing with the study of innovation is the tools and techniques and practices um, from the frontier are actually really useful on a whole variety of problems. We've seen hackathons for first responders, finding people in burning buildings, um, all the way through to addressing disabilities. And there's something about galvanizing a community, the key ecosystem stakeholders, to address these problems. Uh, as Fiona says, an idea is a match between a problem and a solution. So it's really useful for people to bring interesting problems to these innovation ecosystems and then see what the creative processes of innovation bring out as different solutions, often ones that won't come about through business as usual. It's interesting as you talk about these very large scale impacts, you mentioned again your capital I mm -hmm. versus small I model. Uh, I think one of the things that people are curious about is to what extent do you think small small I and capital I are compatible or incompatible for mm -hmm. the same organizations or even for the same ecosystems. And just to drill down a little bit further as well, or perhaps clarify, uh, I think I heard you define capitalize in terms of the 10x outcome 
Uh, and in some cases, that doesn't require a 10x input, presumably. A small input can have a big outcome if you're, if you're lucky. Yes. No, it can. Out of the frontier of 10x, you know, sometimes the biggest 10x's impact come from a small number of very particular people. But not every ecosystem might have those kinds of sort of top coders. Um, and the important thing is it's a spectrum from the 10x impact uh, down to the 10% little i. And so different efforts will be at different points on the spectrum. For an organization or an ecosystem that is new to attempting innovation projects, we often encourage them to start modestly, to start with small experiments around what can they do that will have a 10% change. Um, but ultimately, you know, most of these organizations want to at least have some larger bets out on the capital I, whether it's a region hoping that they'll have some startups that will achieve unicorn billion dollar status, uh, or companies hoping they'll have sort of moonshot projects in their portfolio. But there's a lot of honorable innovation that is done down at the more modest 10% level, and it can be a very good place for organizations or ecosystems to start. I just want to pick up on this point, uh, Peter, that you made in this question about are these things incompatible. I think that traditionally they have been, and we've often thought about them that way. I think when we frame this in the language of um, innovation loops, experimentation, evaluation, they actually become more of a spectrum. And we can think about some of that shared language, what's going to vary, I think, and time is really uh, the time horizon of expectations and the selection criteria and perhaps the nature of who we have on the various teams. Now that we can put a lot of that innovation loop of structure on things, uh, which I think allows us then to have better learning across organizations, which probably makes this uh, less challenging in some ways because we can really uh, take lessons and processes from one part of the uh, innovation spectrum and apply it to the other. That's interesting. That, that definition of shifting from a categorical way of thinking to mm -hmm. this more spectrum way of thinking that you're describing uh, perhaps goes back to some of the leadership challenges that, that you were talking about as well, uh, which is uh, there's, an, there's an awful lot of ambiguity I'm hearing here. Yeah. Uh, and to what extent are leaders able to not only handle that ambiguity themselves, but help their teams and their organizations handle ambiguity? In the last couple of minutes, have you seen any uh, ways that uh, particular organizations uh, or, or individual executives have been especially effective at doing that? I mean, I think that some of the leaders that we've seen who are becoming more effective at that are people who do recognize this point, that this is a spectrum. And so they're not putting the big eye innovation over in some uh, organization that's sort of shut away and isolated in an ivory tower. They're increasingly uh, relying on the ecosystem to help support that. Uh, but they're also taking some of those lessons and ideas and practices, the hackathons and accelerators and competitions, and using them inside their organizations to bring some sort of coherence and consistency, perhaps using them to look for the smaller changes. Mm -hmm. So I think it is the leaders that are effective have the shared language and are perhaps trying to sort of bring shared practices across. I think it's sort of helping make it more simple for people. I think so. This is a huge topic and I fear we've run out of time today, but we go into this in greater depth in our in-person and our online courses mm -hmm. because this is one of the challenges and this is why we say understand innovation, but also realize that innovation needs that leadership if it's going to happen effectively. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. And for the audience uh, at home now, you, or at work, where some of you might be, uh, you can see some related programs uh, that Phil and Fiona uh, teach in and talk more about these uh, topics in much greater uh, depth. They mentioned some of them uh, in today's presentation. And they've also shared with us some suggestions for uh, additional uh, reading. Uh, that also go into into more depth, to more depth. So it's really forced to me now to thank uh, Dr. Phil Budden and Professor Fiona Murray uh, for spending this time with us and helping us understand uh, just a little bit more of the great work that you and your colleagues are doing here to study innovation, not only here at MIT, uh, but in the world and for the world, which I think is a perfect summary of uh, the reason that MIT exists. So once again, thank you both of you. Thank you, everybody, who's uh, tuned in to uh, watch and listen to uh, today's webinar, which will uh, later be uh, posted and available for those that were in time zones that weren't able uh, to join us live or if anybody wants to go back uh, and review what we talked about today. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you.